Hi, folks. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here with Monish Pavrai. Monish, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, William, it's always fun to hang out with you. Ha, thanks. I feel like I've probably been mispronouncing your name for the last 15 or 20 years. So have I got it more or less right? How did you pronounce it? Monish Pabrai. Yeah, I think that's close enough. <laughs> it's a good approximation. If I've got it wrong for this <laughs> long, I, I, I suspect I'm going to keep getting it wrong for many years. I do remember my, my, one... My sister still mispronounces my name, so it's okay. <laughs> You, you once told me the pronunciation, and I was like, no, nah, that's wrong. Sorry. And so uh, <laughs> I, I demonstrated my haplessness on this front. So I wanted to start by asking you about Charlie Munger. You're, you're obviously in a very unusual and privileged position of having Charlie as a close friend and mentor. I think you've been friends with Charlie since Warren Buffett introduced you to him back in about 2008. And so I wondered if you could talk about just what it's been like to hang out with him over the last 14 years, whether there are any particularly memorable experiences you've had with him, and and then maybe we can get to what you've learned from being in Charlie's orbit over all these years. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I have to pinch myself at all of this because, you know, I think on on many fronts, I think we, all of us, are very privileged to be living in the time of Warren and Charlie. Uh, I mean, you know, it'd be kind of like living in the time of Newton or Einstein or you know, any of those, you know, luminaries we look up to. And uh, so that's wonderful. And I think in in my case, uh, I would have never expected uh, to have a, any kind of a interaction directly with Warren or Charlie. You know, I think that's, uh, you know, that was just not part of the equation. And, and then, of course, you know, Warren takes bribes. And if you bribe him enough, then he'll sit down and have a meal with you. And uh, this year, actually, I think was the last year that he auctioned off uh, the charity lunch. Uh, so I'm not sure what it went for, but uh, that's the last one. And so since he was uh, willing to take the bribe and uh, I had bid for a few years, but in uh, 2007, uh, Guy Spear and I prevailed and we won the lunch and we met Warren in 2008. And and I pretty much just expected that to be it, you know, that you know, I, I wanted to just thank him in person. And I did not expect to end up with any type of a ongoing relationship. Uh, and what Warren did uh, during the lunch is he, uh, he kind of got competitive when my, my wife uh, told him, uh, my ex-wife told him that uh, uh, she was, her true love in life really was Charlie. <laughs> and, uh, and and Warren immediately told her that Charlie's a very boring guy. And I'm really the one out of the two who's way more interesting. And uh, and then he told us that he would arrange lunch with Charlie uh, just so we could see how boring Charlie is and we could compare, you know, who was a better lunch companion. And I thought he was joking. But then the following week, his assistant sent a note to Charlie's assistant. And that led to, uh, actually in 2009, uh, lunch with Charlie uh, at the California Club, and uh, and that uh, actually the funny thing was I thought that Charlie Munger lunch was way better than the Buffett lunch, and uh, it was kind of like buy one get one free, which was great, and uh, and and of course you know you get tongue tied and you know all of this, and I remember Charlie came to that lunch and then he reaches into his coat pocket and he pulls out this printout, uh, which has like Guru Focus, you know, written on it. And it has my U.S. portfolio, you know, the 13 Fs get filed. And uh, he's looking at the portfolio. And, you know, this is this is 2009. Everything has crashed and burned. Okay. And, you know, I mean, my, my net worth is decimated by like two thirds or something. Uh, and uh, and he, he looks at uh, Sears Holdings which was in my portfolio and he just shakes his head you know like that like like quite uh, extreme disapproval and um, and then uh, i remember i we, we probably had some brief discussion on sears and the markets were always already closed that day when we met but the next day i wiped sears holdings out of my portfolio uh, which was a great uh, I would say instant take home value from the lunch. And, uh, but, but anyway, I think, I think the, the thing about, uh, and then of course, you know, what I also did not expect is 
that lunch would lead to additional interactions and a friendship with Charlie. Uh, I never expected that. And then uh, uh, I think a few years after that, I became a substitute bridge partner of his. So every Friday uh, afternoon, Charlie would play bridge at the LA Country Club uh, with his friends. And um, they started inviting me when one of the old guys couldn't make it or couldn't get out of bed or something. Uh, and so usually I'd get to know on Thursday night or Friday morning that we have a slot. And uh, I'd say, yeah, you don't need to give me notice. I just drive over. And, um, and so that th- those, those afternoons uh, were really amazing because we would start with, with lunch uh, at the LA Country Club. And I'd be sitting there at this table for four and just sitting across, you know, across from me would be Charlie Munger and Rick Gurren. And, you know, I'm looking at these two guys, you know, historic figures and all of this. And, you know, I would, I would ask them all these questions about the deals in the 60s and the early days when they were working at the Pacific Stock Exchange. And they were, um, I mean, you know, any, any type of lunch or bridge or dinner with Charlie is always very entertaining. I mean, it's very educational, but it's very entertaining. One of the things that happened uh, the first time I met him for lunch was uh, as he was talking, I heard the F word. And, um, and I'm thinking to my, in my head, uh, did God just utter the F word? And as I'm, you know, processing that in the, my head, I hear another F word. Okay. And, and there were a number of F words during that meal. And then I realized uh, after that, that every time I met God, the F word just flowed freely. And I'm actually surprised that at the Berkshire meeting or the Daily Journal meeting, there's no F word because it's so natural the way he speaks uh, that, that I have never seen him on an interaction with me uh, where there wasn't colorful language. That's it, never happened. Is it just him being em- emphatic or exuberant? I think he's, or? He's, he's with friends, and I think he's using it the way we use it. He uses it to make uh, make a point, you know, like those you know. It's a, those this, this, jokes, will, this know. will be bleeped out of, out of this yeah, episode, yeah, sadly. Yeah, it's but it's, okay. it's, like, and, it's and, like a verbal exclamation mark. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was just like the way we use it, you know, because <laughs> yeah. the... There's a there's a video on YouTube. Just I'll digress for a second uh, with this guy uh, Bhagwan Rajneesh, and you can you can you can Google it. Uh, where it's about I think twenty minutes on the F word, and uh, and I think it's incredible. I think that's a video worth watching about how uh, how it's it's such a versatile word in the English language. I, uh, I'm a but, fan of using the, the full extent of the English language, <laughs> but I'm not allowed to in this podcast, apparently. So, 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 so anyway, but Manish, anyway, tell me, I mean, I, tell me, because the, the, like the real, the like, is there something that's changed in the way you operate in the world from actually being up close with with Charlie all these years? Like, has he changed the yeah, way that you yeah. think and well, behave? I, I would, I would, I would say, I would say that the greatest learnings I've had from Charlie. Uh, have not come from, uh, well, he said some pretty amazing things to me, so they'd be, it'd be up there. But I would say that besides some of those things he said to me, which have been transformational for me, most of my learning from him uh, on the one-on-one interactions have come from observing him. Uh, not what he's saying, but observing how he functions and observing how his kind of day is structured and how he arranges his life and, you know, the interaction with his grandkids or interaction with his kids or his daughter-in-law or his manservant and all of that. So I think that when I just observed, you know, Charlie with his friends and family and just with himself when he's reading or something, those have taught me uh, a lot more. Is there um, stuff that you've consciously cloned from the things you've observed in the way he behaved? Because I, I remember years ago realizing that when you replied to emails, often you would you would write a couple of words in pen at the top on a printout and have it faxed. And I was like, that's what Charlie does. Like, like, so yeah, I, and actually, uh, I probably took that from him because 
I, I had received notes like that from Charlie much before 2009. You know, I'd, I'd send something to him or something to Warren. Warren would sometimes send it to him and then I'd get a note back and that sort of thing. And Warren's notes back many times would be a letter and whatnot, but Charlie was always a scribble and, uh, and whatever. And, uh, but, but I think that the biggest thing I uh, took away, and it's just so daunting, uh, and I still, I still am uh, daunted by it, is, uh, you know, he's, he's set up in his parlor in this kind of lazy boy type easy chair. And on both sides of him are high tables, uh, relatively large tables. And there's a lot of, you know, high-powered lights behind him because his, his eyesight is not that great. But the best analogy I have is that there's a big stack of books on one side and other reading materials and barons and, you know, value line, whatnot. And there's a big stack of books on the other side. And Charlie is like an assembly line devouring. I mean, there's an engine of this these things running through from the unread pile to the red pile. And I would estimate that he's he's reading more than 500 books a year. Hmm. Uh, I think it's more than one a day. Now he doesn't read the way we read. You know, he's skimming a lot, and 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 he's especially skimming a lot when you know he's not he's not you know he finds the author rambling or whatever you know, and so he's trying to get the nuggets he wants, and and they are in such a wide range, and you know usually I. Sometimes I'd go in on a Saturday evening or something to have dinner with him. And he'd be reading something about, you know, global warming, some book on global warming or climate change or something. And then there'd be a, a discussion on that. And sometimes he would be reading about the chief of staff for President Roosevelt. And, and then we'd have a discussion on that. And this, I forget the name of the guy. He was Navy Admiral. And this guy basically was, you know, uh, Roosevelt really trusted him. And Roosevelt trusted very few people. I mean, he was very, very, uh, you know, he had a lot of his cards close to his chest. But with uh, Leahy, yeah, Admiral Leahy, he had complete trust in Admiral Leahy. And Admiral Leahy was kind of like, you know, this guy who was like a frat, frat boy. You know, he liked to have his drinks and whatever. But Roosevelt knew that he didn't have another agenda and that he was loyal and that he could get candid opinions and such from him. So Leahy, uh, which most people don't realize, wielded enormous power, uh, this massive amounts of power in the Roosevelt administration. And so there was a book on, on Leahy. And then, you know, I, I read that book later. So uh, these, these subjects would be uh, all over the place. You know, sometimes I'd go in and he'd be designing the dorms, right? And then he'd be stuck on some subject and he'd say, what's the height of a pickup truck? You know? And I'm like saying, well, let's go ask God Google. <laughs> like, I don't know that. Because he was trying to figure out, you know, how high the parking lot should be and all this kind of stuff. So I'd get all these kind of, you know, weird questions from him uh, on on all of that. But, but you know, there's, there's also... Uh, they, they had so much fun, you know, Warren, Charlie, and, and Rick Gorin. I, I remember that one time uh, Rick and Charlie were sitting across from me at the LA Country Club, and they started talking about, like I said, you know, tell me about one of your deals in the 60s, because they were buying whole companies as well then. So there was this, um, there was this kind of maverick entrepreneur in California who had come up with an additive that you could add to your engine in your car and it would plug any leak. Like if the engine developed a leak, this thing would basically, you know, kind of mush over it and your leak would go away. Right. It was kind of this kind of magical. And, and this guy used to go to uh, repair shops with his gun and shoot a hole in the, <laughs> in the engine block in front of the mechanic and then pour his liquid and then say, now put the oil in and nothing would come out. Right. And that's how he built his sales with. So, so anyway, uh, Charlie and Rick Gorin got kind of interested in this company and uh, the company, I mean, the guy 
was a you know scatterbrain entrepreneur he he passed away uh kind of untimely passed away and they were interested in acquiring the business and the business had a lot of debt so what they did was they pretty much bought off all the bank debt and all the debt on the business in effect they they actually had control with the equity was worthless but uh the guy had a widow and a mistress and the widow did not know about the existence of the mistress till he died and he made he made uh the the mistress the executor of his will and he gave some of the assets to the widow and some to the mistress and of course the mistress was um i mean she was you know range of emotions uh, you can imagine and charlie and War- uh, rick said that what they wanted to do was they wanted to make a small payment to both the widow and the mistress for the business uh, even though they didn't have to just to basically you know have their um, blessings that it's okay you can take it right and the wife was had absolutely no interest in cooperating on anything to do with the mistress and um, and so was the mistress they, they were like both on daggers drawn and you know charlie wants to get this deal done and it's not happening so charlie was telling me that he invited the mistress to the california club to have lunch with him and he wanted to you know kind of smooth her feathers and just get her to be cooperative enough to just get this part uh, taken care of and she was a blonde nurse with a large um which large breasts okay and uh, she came to came to his lunch now the california club is a very a uh, conservative place and that's where i met charlie for the first time actually for lunch it's a ornate ornate dining room with all this etiquette you know you wear a jacket and all that stuff and and stuff is a private club anyway so he invited her to lunch she came straight from work and so she's in her nurse's uniform which is about three sizes too small for her <laughs> okay and um, so she sits down to lunch with charlie and all the other members who are looking at charlie think that he's having lunch with a porn star you know and uh, and uh, you know and and in charlie's exact words there were every you know and uh, the, the and, censors and, uh, are going to have a a ball with this episode money <laughs> so so anyway and you know i'm rick and charlie you know they're sitting in front of me this is god and his first apostle and you know this is the kind of you know uh, stuff we're talking about and anyway charlie was able to calm her down get her okay then he met the wife and got them to be just cooperative enough to get that deal done and they both got a little bit of money and they moved on from there and uh, so anyway these guys these guys just had a had a blast on on so many deals and, so so, uh, so many I'm, things that they were doing if i'm trying to draw some some lessons and morals stretching myself to draw some lessons and morals from what we've just discussed it seems like part of it part of it from what you were saying before is he's he's an absolutely voracious learning machine and that's not stopped even now at the age of 98 just just consuming information um on a on an industrial scale and then second there's a sense in which he's constructed his life in a way that's really true to him the um his family his business his hobbies his bridge playing his friendships his partnerships and there's a kind of joyfulness to that sense of alignment in his life that he's done what he's loved is, is that a fair observation yeah i mean i think that's that's very fair i mean i think i think that i've tried to tell this to charlie a number of times I've told Charlie actually Charlie without you there's no Berkshire Hathaway and uh, and and he would always dismiss it you know he was very dismissive so the thing is that he is not looking for credit you know i mean i i've also told him that i don't believe costco would have done half as well if he wasn't on the board and uh, and uh, and he'd again dismiss that you know and so the thing is that i think the thing is that he he adds so much value to so many humans and so many businesses and all of that and to humanity to all of us and 
he discounts it all, right? And like, like, like there's no ego about it. He doesn't look back. I, the one, the biggest thing, one of the biggest things I've learned about both of them, uh, Warren and Charlie, is they don't look back. They look forward. So, you know, when I look at them and look at the past, what they've accomplished, it's a huge body of work that they've accomplished in their lives. But that's not how Charlie functions. He doesn't spend time looking back. He is, is all his energies are focused on the problem at hand. So, for example, I would meet him and he was wrestling with the succession at the Daily Journal, right? And it completely occupied, you know, and he wanted to do it well, wanted to do it correctly. And in the end, I think the way he got it done was incredible. He, does, he it's, a, it's a brilliant solution and an amazing person he brought on board. And, and I, I observed all of his trials and tribulations as he was going through that process. And it was just brilliantly done because I think he understood that, for example, in that case, he had one silver bullet. Okay, he, his only silver bullet was who he hired, who he put in that role. He could not, after that, have any further influence. And in fact, the person they put in is the chairman and the CEO. So they, they made the person the chairman as well. And Munger has moved down to just a board member, right? And so it's an enormous amount of trust uh, that they put. But like I said, and, and he turned down, I know he turned down some very, very good candidates from people he really trusted and admired a lot. And, uh, and so uh, just looking at that whole process. So, you know, like I said, they, they, they always, and then he'd always moan and groan saying, we've got so much money, we can't find anything to buy, you know. Or sometimes he'd tell me, Warren's not even uh, excited about buying Berkshire stock at current prices, you know, and, and so on. So uh, they, they just don't look back, you know. They look at the problems in front of them and they want to do the best job. That's another great learning for me is not to, not to kind of rest on our laurels and say, oh, look, you know, I've got Dakshina, I've done this, or I've done that. You know, I'd say, you know, let's look forward. Let's keep chopping wood going forward. Do you feel that, that Charlie is a very different type of investor than Warren? Like, what's, what's the difference between, because, I, I mean, even something like Alibaba, right, or Costco that, that Charlie would own and that Warren wouldn't look at, what, what's the, where do they diverge, do you think, in their approach to, to solving this game, this puzzle? I, I think they, they obviously have a lot of similarities. In, in how they invest, they used to talk a lot in their younger days, you know, I mean, and uh, I think those, those conversations have become fewer now uh, because part of it is, you know, they've had so much interaction, almost know what the other guy is, is thinking and, and, uh, and, and such. Um, I think, I think war, uh, Charlie got to understanding the importance of better businesses, you know, better to buy a good business at a fair price and a fair business at a good price. I think he got that understanding well before Warren. And, uh, and I think it took Warren more time just because I think he's been so successful uh, in the traditional Grammian approach. And, and that, uh, one of the things that has, I think, uh, a difference between them is when, when Charlie sees um, a tremendous business, I mean, they're both chief skates. And they're both not willing to pay up. But one of the areas, for example, where they diverged was Costco, right? And, uh, you know, Charlie tried to have Berkshire take a much larger position than Costco. And Warren's perspective was it's too expensive, right? And Charlie would always say, well, for some things you pay up, right? And, and so there was some divergence in, in a view there. There was also a, uh, a divergence uh, in BYD, you know, so I remember, you know, I think we may remember, like, I think Charlie told Warren that uh, Chung Fu Wang is like Thomas Edison and uh, you should invest with him. And Warren just kind of ignored that. And then he said, well, he's like Thomas Edison and Henry Ford, uh, both in the same person. And Warren still ignored that. And then Charlie told him he's like Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, and Bill Gates, all in the same person. And at that point, um, what Charlie, Charlie said to me is he went ahead after I made that third comment. 
uh, putting three people in one person, but he didn't use his own money. So what he did was, it's kind of like these people, like, like kids running a lemonade stand, the way they talk about it. He said he didn't use his own money. He went to David Soko and had mid-American energy use their money to buy the stake in, uh, in uh, BYD. And so uh, the 250 million that Berkshire Hathaway invested in, uh, in BYD came from mid-America, which I think at that time, Berkshire owned 80% of, right? And then he put David Sokol on the board of BYD. And, and so Charlie said to me, in the end, he didn't even use his own pot of cash. You know, he went to another pot somebody else controlled and said, okay, you do it from there. And of course, Berkshire would have done slightly better. I think now they have like 91% or something of uh, Berkshire Hathaway Energy. They would have done a little bit better. It's been a major home run. I, I mean, I it's made it's billions like, of dollars, right? BYD for well, Berkshire. Well, you know, they bought, they bought at eight Hong Kong dollars per share. And it's at 260 Hong Kong dollars per share right now. And, and, and so this is uh, 14 years and more than a 30x. And I think uh, if I'm right in saying the, the idea originally came from Li Lu, who invests a yes. portion of Charlie's fortune and has become a billionaire in his own right. And, and I know that you and Li Lu have become good friends over the years and, and that you think enormously highly of him. And I, I wondered if you could talk a bit about what Charlie saw in Li Lu because he's clearly an absolutely extraordinary person. And, and at the same time, what, what, what you think is so remarkable about Li Lu as an investor and a person? The funny thing is I asked Charlie that exact same question uh, many years ago. And, You're uh, a journalist I'll, at heart, Manish. I'll, <laughs> I'll get to your answer in a second. But one of the things uh, Charlie told me many years ago, he said in the investing business, it's really important to have somebody to talk to. Uh, just, you know, you're on the echo chamber and so on. So I said, oh, you mean like you have Warren? He said it wasn't, wasn't always Warren, but I had somebody. And he said, it's really important that you have somebody to talk to. And the person shouldn't be, shouldn't be someone who reports to you. It should be kind of like a peer type relationship. And uh, he, told, he told Lilu and me, that he wanted us to get together for lunch once a month. He basically pretty much instructed us that the two of you, uh, I want the two of you to meet once a month for lunch. And, uh, and I, told, I told Charlie and Lilu, if Lilu wants to waste, you know, an afternoon or, you know, hour or uh, a month with me, I'm more than happy to do that. You know, life is great. What's wrong? What's not to like about that? And so, uh, before Lilu moved to Seattle, and of course I'm in Austin now, we used to get together uh, once a month, and we finally settled on going to the same place every time, which works really well for me. And uh, and we'd go to uh, there's a Din Tai Fung in Arcadia, which is the number one restaurant in Taiwan and really good food. And so we'd go to Din Tai Fung, which used to be a little bit of a zoo, uh, but the food was great. And then later, uh, Li Lu uh, got this uh, old Chinese lady as a chef. And he told me that uh, she's actually better than Din Tai Fung, so we could meet at my place. <laughs> and so then I'd go to uh, he'd have an apartment in Pasadena, and I'd, I'd meet him over there, and that was even better. Uh, so anyway, the food was great, uh, but the, uh, the conversation uh, was really good too. And, and I, I remember one time... Uh, Lilu told me during the, one of these lunches, he said, um, yeah, you, should, uh, you should look at and maybe you should buy Amor Pacific. Okay. And I said, Amor what? He said, Amor Pacific. Okay. He said, it's a Korean company. Okay. And uh, I said, okay. And, you know, I went back and I looked at this and everything's in Korean. Excuse my French. Everything's yeah. in Korean. Okay. And... Um, and I, I figure out it's a cosmetics company. And then I also figure out that there's some of their products you can actually find in Southern California. But I could never really figure the business out. Okay. And I really couldn't really get my arms around it in terms of like, what was, what was the secret sauce here or whatever. So I eventually just, you know, left it alone. 
And that went up like something like 80, 80x after he told me that. Okay. I just watched it like go crazy. Okay. And they, they had this uh, product which, you know, this extract from snails, uh, which women would apply on their, on their faces and it would make them younger make them look like younger, you know, the wrinkles kind of go away or whatever. And what, what, uh, what Amor Pacific had been able to do, what they had been able to convince Chinese women that, uh, and I think now uh, Korea is very well known for being kind of the state of the art for Asian women's skin products and so on. And they had, they had had a massive tailwind from Chinese women clamoring for their products and they done really well. And, so I said, you know, well, such is life. And then, you know, after, a, I think, a year or something, he tells me, um, you should buy Mao Thai. Okay. And I said, you know, uh, Lilu, and I, I used some colorful language with him. I said, you know, you give me these names. Then I go, and I can't find, figure out head or tail. So I'm not going to do it that way. Please spend the next 20 minutes explaining Mao Thai to me. He said, why didn't you ask me that for Amor Pacific? I would have done that. <laughs> I said, okay, you know, we, we're, we're gradually learning. So then he proceeds to explain Mao Tai to me. And Mao Tai is now the most valued uh, liquor company in the world. It's the most valuable company. So it basically just has one product, but it's more valuable than any of the other uh, global liquor players. And, and, and it was uh, depressed at the time, right? Because there was a corruption scandal and people could no longer give... Yeah, Mao so Thai as a very, gift. Yeah, it, it's it's very very heavily consumed by government officials who are being wined and dined by people in the private sector and all that. And of course, the Mao Thai is flowing freely. And then it became that if you were out at lunch and you were a government official and there was Mao Thai on the table, uh, you wouldn't be seen after that. You pretty much would suddenly disappear off the face of the earth, never to be heard from again. And... Uh, yeah, so there, uh, when they were cracking down, it became synonymous because the government's perspective was nothing good is happening if there's Mao Tai on the team. You know, one bottle, uh, I don't know what the prices are now, but when I was when I held the stock, it was over $1,000, $1,200 for, for a bottle. And it might be a lot higher by now. And, um, and, uh, and this time I was actually able to understand the business. They actually had English... Uh, financials, and it was pretty straightforward to figure out and uh, made the investment. And like everything else in my life, I sold too soon. And um, But anyway, those lunches were really good. And uh, uh, Lilu and I became great friends. And uh, and actually, there's, uh, uh, there's, one, uh, there's one business that we actually then collaborated on, uh, which was Micron. And, uh, and uh, so that actually went from me to him. You know? mm. I mean, the, all these other ones were coming from him to me. And, uh, and so we had a, we had a good, uh, uh, good interaction and exchange on that. And then uh, he, uh, he took a position and I think he'll hold that for a while. And, and what do you, what, to go back to that original question, what do you think Charlie saw in him? Because I remember Charlie once saying, I can't remember whether it was to you or Guy Spear that um, it was lucky Lilu was a force for good because he's so unbelievably talented that if he wanted to rule the world, he he could be. And if if I remember rightly, I, I've met Lilu a few a few times, but I've never been able to interview him on the record, only, only kind of privately on background. I when I was studying him, I think he was the first person at Columbia University to get a triple major, which he got while sleeping in a in an apartment in the living room that he shared with about eight people. And this wasn't even in his first language. I mean, he had just yeah, come and, from and, Tiananmen and it's Square. Not, it's, not, it's not just, a, it's not actually a triple major, it's three degrees. It's a MBA, it's a law degree, and it's an undergraduate, all at the same time. You know, I mean, I mean <laughs> these are like complete, it's not like a, a bachelor's degree with three majors, you know, this is, this is well beyond that. In a language that's a foreign language to him. Right. And he did really well in all of them. But uh, when I asked Charlie the question, he said, well, it was a complete no brainer. And he said, I just had to look at the track record. So he said, here was a here was a guy who was on student loans. He had no money. And on the float of the student loans, which is, you know, the, he would get the money in, you know, January, maybe has to pay it in April or something. 
he said he would invest the float of the student loans. And when he graduated, he had a million dollars. Okay, so, so <laughs> when Lilu finished at Columbia with Columbia's loan money, with uh, the stuff he was doing, and then after that, he, he went into venture capital and he had an incredible record. Uh, you know, one of his early investments is a company now that we know as Capital IQ. Uh, and actually, a lot of what is capital IQ, uh, a lot of influence from uh, from Li Lu and uh, capital IQ basically is the closest thing you can get to to Bloomberg. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a really incredible uh, product. I mean, like we have a subscription, we pay them an arm and a leg, and uh, we we can't get around it. Um, and, and you know, so so he's he's been an incredible investor, and I think what 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 Charlie said was it was one of the easiest decisions to figure out that Lilu was amazing. He said that his track record was incredible. And then I think the other piece is that uh, what Munger and Buffett are both extremely good at is they're uh, incredible judge of, judges of humans. And uh, so it was... Uh, uh, you know, Ron Olson's wife, she worked for one of these uh, uh, human rights groups, which was, you know, protesting things happening in China. And uh, they had helped Li Lu when he came to the U.S. Uh, in term, because, you know, he, he was active in Tiananmen Square and all of that. And uh, there was an event, uh, I think, in Santa Barbara or something that uh, she had hosted and Lilu had come for that event and Charlie had gone there as well. And that's where they met for the first time. And, uh, and then, uh, so it was an accidental meeting. And then I think uh, once Charlie started to uh, talk to Lilu and understand how he invested, but I would also say the following, I think that uh, Charlie made Lilu an even better investor. So, they would meet uh, once a week for breakfast. And, and of course, you know, uh, Lilu will discuss different investments and whatever with, with Charlie. And I think Charlie's, uh, I mean, I, I, what I've found with Charlie is sometimes I bring up businesses to him that I'm looking at. He may never, never have looked at the business. And he's able to, in about five or 10 seconds, I mean, I've seen the brain working. It's kind of amazing how it just slices through all the models. And he's done with the business in about 10 seconds. And I've been, you know, looking at it for weeks. And what he comes up with, I, it, it eluded me. So I'll give you a, an example. Um, I, I've always uh, admired uh, this business called credit, credit acceptance. Uh, and it shows up in some, you know, prominent, investor portfolio, then credit credit acceptance has done very well for a very long period of time. I mean, they've compounded at north of 20% for a very long period of time. Um, they make auto loans to people who have the worst credit histories. Uh, I mean, you know, you, you have defaulted a number of times, you've not paid your bills a number of times, uh, and, and the interest rates are very high. Uh, the interest rates might be in the 20% odd percent rate or 30 odd percent rate. And also what they've done is that the cars, when the, when the, when credit acceptance gives you a car, they put a device in the car, which would basically allow them to stop the car from functioning remotely. They could control remotely to basically turn off the vehicle. It could not be driven again. So when their payment doesn't show up on time, the car stops working. And, and then the person calls and then they say, we didn't get your payment. And the payment arrives and the car is working again. So credit acceptance uh, has also got an interesting model where they work with car dealerships and they make them put skin in the game. So they own part of the note on the car. So basically the loan is made partially by the, uh, by the auto insurer, by, uh, auto dealership and partially by credit acceptance. And they've been able to work this system where it's 
incredibly profitable. Now there's a there's a side to credit acceptance, which is really good, which is these people would not even have a car and they wouldn't even be able to get to work were it not for coming to credit acceptance. But when I brought it to Charlie, he just said, uh, we don't want to own that kind of business. And, uh, and it took him less than five seconds. He'd never heard of credit acceptance before. I spent about, you know, exactly what I told you about five minutes on the business and he'd already processed in his head. And I think what his perspective was is that one of the filters that he runs through is win, win, win. Everything has to be a win across the board. And I think what Charlie saw is that the high interest rates is not, even though you could justify it a hundred different ways, he just said it's not the kind of business we want to be in, right? So his bar is this high, right? And I had been looking at that for several weeks and that particular point never made it through to me. And there are lots of really high quality investors who own credit acceptance. In many cases, it's their largest position. And, uh, you know, so it went through their filters. It never went through Charlie's filters. And uh, so that's, uh, you know, it's just an amazing brain. Just to see, I mean, so many times I brought up questions to Charlie. I'm, I'm, I'm facing fork in the road issues at Dakshana. And I'm kind of torn about what to do. And I explain the issue in about five minutes to Charlie, he's never been to India. Uh, he comes up with an answer and it's always the perfect answer. I said, why didn't I think of that? Why I, was I confused about it? I remember that? also when you decided years ago that you were gonna set up um, an insurance business and you, uh, you decided that you were gonna clone what Warren and Charlie had done and Ajit Chain and you were, you were gonna use the float to, um, uh, to become super, super, super rich as opposed to just super rich. And um, and Charlie, if I remember rightly, just looked at you and kind of shook his head. And is that right? Like, was there something that he saw instantly that he saw about you that you were not wired to run that business as well as you were wired to run Dakshana and to run Fabri Funds? Well, and I think also he, he made a comment to me uh, many years ago where he said in the very long run, insurance will be a small part of Berkshire. It's a very remarkable statement. I mean, if you look at Berkshire today, insurance dominates. They just, you know, bought Allegheny and so on. Uh, and, and I think he may be, he may be right about that. Uh, that, you know, if you go 20, 30 years out, who knows what the size of the insurance business is. I mean, basically, if you stop writing different lines over time, that float is going to go down and so on. Um, yeah, and actually, uh, there are some very elementary things about the insurance business that I missed, that I missed when I uh, decided to go down that path. And I learned in a very expensive way that the Berkshire insurance operation is a completely different operation than anything else. And that insurance is a really tough way to make, make a living. It's a really difficult business. And you, you they, make it, they make it look simple, but it's really hard. You, you eventually sold the business to Francis Chu, right? And, and Francis, what, I mean, Francis had played an integral role in, in building Fairfax as well. And, and you obviously know Francis and Prem Watson from Fairfax very well. Was there, was there something that enabled them and Ajit Jain at Berkshire to do this stuff that, that sort of a, a secret source that you didn't have and that Charlie could see that, that it didn't suit you? Well, I think, I think insurance inherently is a really difficult business. And I think even this year at the Berkshire meeting, uh, Warren alluded to that. He, he said from 1970 to 1986, or 85 till Ajit Jain showed up, I think 86 till Ajit Jain showed up, he was struggling. He, he had multiple insurance companies that blew up on him, hmm. uh, like really bad, like 140% combined ratios uh, and such. It was, it was pretty ugly. And, uh, and, and when Warren entered the insurance business, he entered with a great business. National Indemnity, well, created by Jack Ringwald, was an incredible insurance company because they were doing excess surplus lines that others were not doing. So they had 
a lot of uh, margin and and profit profitability just because there wasn't that much competition. You know, kind of insuring taxi taxi cabs and that sort of thing that most insurers are not willing to do. And uh, so he he started with a great core, and then when he tried to expand. Uh, things blew up on him till Ajit showed up, and then then things started running better. Even at Fairfax, Fairfax has had a lot of indigestion with insurance. They've had a number of businesses that they bought, insurance companies they bought that have given them huge problems. You know, the combined ratios went crazy, and uh, the purchase price turned out to be very very high, and so on and so forth. So. It's a difficult business, even for the best of, of them to run. Uh, Geico is unusual, and they've run well. But even now, you can see that on the on the underwriting side, they're having issues versus being as good as Progressive and so on, uh, just because they haven't invested in the telematics and all of that. So the, the lesson I got from insurance, there were really two or three lessons that came out. One is that it's a really bizarre business because you sell a product whose real cost you don't know until five or 10 years from now. So I, I decide to sell you a policy and I don't really know if I'm going to make or lose money on that policy until five years have passed. And I'm basing the pricing based on models, but those models can be off and the world can unfold in a different way. So one of the things that happened, which I'm really happy about is that uh, Francis is a much better operator for insurance than I am. So I think I think uh, the company I sold him has done extremely well under Francis. I, I don't think it would have done as well under me. But also what happened that gave him massive tailwinds is we had two years of pandemic and uh, no one went to work and the workers' comp policies, the premiums already paid, there were no claims because nobody had worked. There's no workplace injuries. Mm. And so they had huge underwriting profits for the last couple of years, which gave them a, a, a very nice cushion. And that will change now as people start spending more time at work and so on. Uh, but that was a that was partially a great tailwind, but he also got a great tailwind because he was sitting in treasury bills in March 2000 when the world went upside down, uh, March 2020. And then he went to work and bought bonds at you know crazy prices and did really well as well. Yeah, he he once he, he called me sometime after that, and he took me through what he had done just privately, and it was kind of extraordinary because I I guess it, when I was interviewing him for Richer, Wiser, Happier, he had said uh, there was nothing he could find to buy, and he and he was like, yeah, I could just sit here doing nothing for ten years, and then he sat around doing nothing for years, and he looked kind of foolish because he was just sort of sitting on on all of this dry gunpowder, and and it was such a beautiful example of that that kind of. Charlie Munger approach of salmon fishing, where you, you know, the, his beautiful image of the spear fisherman waiting by the side of the stream doing nothing. And then once in a while, a fat, juicy salmon swims by and you spear it. And here was, here was Francis, who looked like this kind of totally outmoded investor. And in fact, he, he suddenly spears so many salmon in one fell swoop that it, it kind of makes him look like a genius again after 10 years lying fallow. Yeah, and actually, if you look at Berkshire Hathaway, uh, you know, they their core purchase, which is Berkshire Hathaway textile mills, turned out to be horrible. Uh, all their forays into insurance turned out to be horrible for 15 years. And, uh, and the textile business was horrible for 20 years. Uh, they ran it for 20 years before they shut it down. And, and in spite of all of that, we have this amazing business that came out of all of that. And I think, I think, what Munger told me repeatedly is we could not do what we did then now. He said, the world is a lot more competitive. Markets are a lot more efficient. We could not do the kinds of stuff. He said, we were finding where we you know shooting fish in a barrel when the barrel is empty. He said, uh, we just couldn't do that. Kind of, we can't do that kind of stuff now. And, uh, and the other thing he said that our, which he also said publicly, he said that our record would be a, a shadow of itself if we were not learning machines. So I think what happened is that C's taught them a lot of lessons. Blue chip stamps taught them a lot of lessons. Buffalo News taught them a lot of lessons. And uh, diversified retailing taught them a lot of lessons. 
and even the textile mill and the insurance forest. So they, the, the important thing with these guys was they were learning machines and they absorbed. I am actually really happy that I went into the insurance business. It did not work out. I didn't lose my shirt. I got my money back. If I make a mistake and I get my money back, I'm really happy. Okay. And, uh, but I learned a tremendous amount and I know I won't go there again. You know, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. I'm struck with you, Monish, about how many times I've seen you do something that you have a very high conviction about. And you think this is a fantastic idea. And you tell me and other people what a brilliant idea it is. And we're all totally sold on it. And then a few months later, you're like, no, nope, didn't work. And, and you're very unsentimental about it. And you, you change. I've seen you do it with things like Seritage that you owned or Alibaba or this insurance business that you were running. And, and it strikes me actually as one of your great strengths is it, it is kind of um, strong opinions lightly held. There's this willingness to change. Can you talk a bit about that? Because it seems very fundamental to the way you operate. Yeah, so I think, you know, if we go back to John Templeton, you know, he would say that the best analysts would be wrong one out of three times. And in fact, uh, he was a mentor to Prem Vatsa, Fairfax, and Prem would go to Bahamas once a year to spend time with John Templeton. John Templeton told him, he told Prem that uh, if you're wrong half the time, you're going to end up with a tremendous track record. Okay. And, and so one of the things we have to remember about investing is that the error rate, even for the best of us, is going to be really high. And this was one of the reasons why Charlie told me to talk to Lilu. It was one of the reasons why. And in fact, you know, uh, he said to me recently, he said, uh, I remember one time he told me, he said, so you bought Mao Tai? I said, yeah. He said, good. Okay. And then, <laughs> and then recently he said to me, you and uh, Li Lu collaborated on uh, Micron? I said, yeah. He said, the idea came from you? I said, yeah. He said, um, it will do very well. Okay. I said, it's great to have God give that kind of endorsement because I didn't get that in the insurance business from him. And uh, so I think the thing is that this 50% error rate, uh, we have to be really cognizant of and we have to be humble about it. And so you're right, you know, I get excited about things and I, you know, this is the nature of investing is that greed takes over our brains. We look at this company, we look at the upside and the greed takes over. And we have to have artificial mechanisms to damp it down. Talking to someone else is a way to damp it down. Having a checklist is another way to damp it down. Uh, having somebody who actually has a completely opposite point of view uh, and talking to them is another way to damp it. So we need circuit breakers in with all our investment ideas and because the, the animal spirits will run wild because you would see I just, uh, today, in fact, I came across a business that I really like. Uh, I mean, the, I, I still have to drill down on it, but at this point I can't see, um, I can't see what would be wrong with it, but I haven't done the work yet. And, and so it will be really important for me before I do anything with it is to run the checklist, talk to others and just really try to get a, you know, rounded view and then see whether I still want to do something with it or not. Uh, so I think that uh, there are two things that are important in investing. One is that we have to be very cognizant about the fact that this is not brain surgery where you, you know, 3% error rate is bad news. Uh, you're going to have a high error rate. The second is that when you are right, you can be really right and you could have a 10 bagger, 20 bagger or something, which would, you know, cover a lot of sins. And, and the other thing is to have the humility to realize when you have been wrong. So uh, like, I mean, I mean, Heritage is a good example where I thought that uh, I'd looked at it in, in ways to Sunday and it was going to work. And then I finally came to the conclusion that no, there was an error. There was an error in my analysis and that it was going to be some pretty heavy lifting to make it work the way I thought it should. Just because, so just that, because it was too difficult to do the redevelopment in different parts of the country? Yeah, I think it's like, you know, you've got like 150 Balkan states with 150, you know, rules and laws and 
these, I mean, even if I look at a place like Austin, Texas, which has severe housing shortages and severe other real estate issues, the entitlement process and the process for allowing new housing to be created is excruciatingly slow. The wheels of government work very slow and they don't particularly care that we've got these crises and we need more housing and all of that. They've got their own set of, uh, you know, criteria and conditions that they're looking at. And so the, these, the, the redevelopment of the portfolio at Ceritage is very complicated. I think it's a lot more complicated than I had imagined or expected. And I, I realized that the time it would take them to get their arms around that whole thing and to actually get it done uh, would be really difficult. And the second thing is I didn't think they had the team. The second conclusion I came to, the CEO left, and uh, the new the new team. I they had a lot of turnover, and I, the second concern I had was, with a great team, they would find it challenging. With a questionable team, it was not going to happen at all. And so I, at that point, I said that we still had a gain. We bought it so cheap, we still had a gain. And like Stone Trust, I could sell, and I mean Stone Trust, we have a small gain. This is a little larger gain. I said this is awesome. We can get out without a loss. And so we want to do that. So you're very unsentimental when you get to these moments where you think, yep, I, I made a mistake. You you kind of put, I, I mean, I think you did it with Horsehead as well, where Guy held on. Well, I mean, I think, I think, you know, you've, you've talked to people like Howard Marks. And, you know, many times when I listen to Howard Marks, I think I'm listening to a robot. You know, <laughs> I don't mean that in a negative sense. I just yeah. think he's so... Uh, he's so monotone about things. And and I cannot imagine someone like Howard getting crazily emotional. You know, I just don't have a picture that he's he's that kind of guy. Yeah, I always say being like, with like how it is like being with the most superior machine. You feel yeah, so, you feel like he just has this really good rational engine. But at the same time, there's this real paradox, which is that he's super creative. And, and that a lot of his process is actually impressionistic and, and based on gut. So it's a, it, none of this stuff is simple. And I had a similar conversation with Bill Miller the other day that, that'll come out on the podcast soon where, where he said, I was talking to him about being so unemotional. And he said, actually, I cry quite a lot. I can't remember whether he said it's in movies or in, in, in music, I think it was. So, the, the, but, so there's a... There's yeah, a, I mean, I would, say, I would say that when I talk to Charlie about stocks or different subjects there's a very high degree of rationality, extremely high degree of rationality. And I think rationality is a really important trait. I don't think you can do these things uh, if you're not going to be objective. Uh, I think, uh, so patience is really important in investing. It's one of the most important skills. Rationality is up there. So I think that when we realize, we have to be true to ourselves. When we realize we've made a mistake, uh, you cannot lie to yourself. Uh, you have to be candid about the fact that you've made a mistake and, uh, and you have to move on and, uh, and, and go from there. On, on the subject of rationality, before I forget to ask you this, I, I, I was giving a talk about a year or so ago on Fire Island. Uh, and, and I remember, um, so there are a lot of ma- money managers living out there. And I, I was talking about the book and, and I said something about Charlie and how unemotional he is and how when he bought um, uh, Wells Fargo at the bottom tick in 2009, he just had no fear, no anxiety, nothing about it. And I was saying how unemotional he was and how that's the same with people like um, uh, Bill Miller and and Howard Marks, all, all of the best investors. And Chris Davis, who is close to, to Charlie and is now on the board of Berkshire and knows them both very well, sort of came up to me afterwards and he's like it's not entirely right it's more nuanced than that because he if i remember rightly he was talking about how when things went horribly wrong for charlie's hedge fund his limited partnership um back in the 70s i guess during that brutal period around 73 74 he said it was extraordinarily painful for him to to be letting down shareholders can you talk about that nuance because I don't. I feel like I haven't quite cracked this idea of how unemotional uh, the the great investors are. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think I I talked to Charlie about that period, and he said that basically when he when he wound up his partnership in '74, he distributed all the holdings in kind to his partners. Uh, he gave them the positions, and he told them, "Don't do anything; just keep them." Right, and eventually, a lot of those positions got converted into Berkshire stock. And uh, and uh, they were big home runs. I mean, like you know, blue chip and uh, different things got diversified retailing and so on. They all got rolled into Berkshire, and so he said in the end, um, all of them did really well, right? And uh, and I I think that I think he decided that at that point he did not want to manage money. You know, I think he decided at the end of seventy four that. Uh, that that wasn't uh, that wasn't the direction he wanted to go in, and so he made he made that decision and got everyone actually to a good endpoint, and uh, and moved on. So do you when you when you judge his lack of emotion, like like is it how, how would you characterize him? Because he's clearly. I, I had this expectation before I went to interview him, for example, for the for the book, and I thought. God, he's he doesn't suffer fools, and he's brusque, and he can be really rude. He's sort of famous, famously rude at times. Um, like I remember Bill Miller telling me that he'd he'd walked into him in in New York once. He'd run into him uh, and and said, "Charlie, hi." And uh, Charlie turns to him and says, "Who the hell are you?" And and then they end up walking together and chatting for an hour. And you told me, "No, no, he's like this really soft, really sweet guy." And and so there is something there. Um, well, he's a much gentler and softer human being. So I'm I'm wondering if if in addition to being this kind of hyper rational thinker, there is this sort of soft emotional side, or or whether there's a kind of emotional stuntedness that comes with a lot of these great great rational machines. Well, I think I think both Warren and Charlie have um, beautiful souls, and those souls have are covered with a hard exterior. And uh, and the reason they're covered with a hard exterior is so they, I think, don't get hurt. Hmm. Uh, so they have a lot of people coming at them with all kinds of things. And so I think this exterior protects them. And But I think when you get to their inner circle, the inner circle doesn't deal with the hard exterior. You're just dealing with the person. And that's why I I find that Charlie is a very different person when I'm playing bridge with him or when I'm having dinner with him versus at the Berkshire meeting, for example, on stage and so on. Those are two very different people. Um, and uh, so he has a very high degree of emotions. I think he's able to control them. I have had uh, a lot of great input into uh, struggles I had in my personal life from Charlie, uh, where I found that the empathy level was really high. So these were not investments, uh, the, you know, discussions related to investments or money or any of those things. They were related to kind of human things. And, uh, you know, when I was having trouble in my marriage and I discussed those things with him, uh, he was amazing. He was just incredible and, uh, and uh, was, was able to see, uh, see me through and, and gave me tremendous uh, advice and, you know, uh, and in the end, I think uh, um, I'm in a much better place now than I used to be. And so Charlie was very helpful. And that that came from this really warm, soft person with a very high empathy and high emotional uh, understanding and, and such. So that was beautiful. Hey, everybody. Trey Lockerby here from We Study Billionaires. And I wanted to tell you about a new company that I absolutely love, and that is called Trade. Trade combines two of my favorite things, coffee and technology. So what you do is you go to drinktrade.com. There's a super simple survey that you take, and then it tells you which coffee they're going to send you that you are literally guaranteed to love. Meaning if you don't love it, they'll send you a new bag of coffee for free. And from there, you can keep experimenting so you're not falling into the same rut of drinking the same coffee over and over and over again. There are so many different types of roasters, levels of roast, beans from different parts of the world. There's plenty to nerd out on here. So why not be adventurous and try some new stuff? After I took the quiz, they sent me a bag from Sight Glass Coffee in Northern California, and it's literally my favorite coffee of all time. 
Normally, I've been drinking a coffee where I have to sweeten it with honey and almond milk, but this coffee, I could actually drink it black. It was so delicious just on its own. And right now, Trade is offering subscribers a total of $30 off your first order plus free shipping when you go to drinktrade.com slash TIP or click the link in the description below. That's more than 40 cups of coffee for free. Get started by taking the quiz at drinktrade.com slash TIP and let Trade find the perfect coffee for you. That's drinktrade.com slash TIP for $30 off. And it, it's interesting to me that you see this quality in him of having this kind of slightly tough, um, scary exterior, but a gentle interior, because I actually think that's probably a pretty good description of you as well, because I, I sort of... I, you, you're always kind of slightly intimidating. And actually, I think the more I've got to know you and become friends with you over the years, I think there's a sort of, there's a softness under the sort of bombast and, and, and opinion. So I, I suspect you, when you see that in him, you're also kind of seeing it in yourself. Well, I think, I think so. One of the things that really was, I think, life altering for me and enhanced my life a lot was my membership in YPO. And uh, so one of the things that happens YPO, which is Young Presidents Organization, is we get put into these groups of eight to 12, which are forum. And the interesting thing about forum is that uh, everything that goes on in forum is confidential. And because I cannot even share with my spouse what's going on, uh, people are willing to, to open up about things that they would not, never open up, even with very good friends. And what I found is that in forum, magic happens when you open up. Like many times this has happened to me. I mean, I've been in YPO for 25 years. Many times I have a problem and I've wrestled with this problem and had a hundred times and I can't really find a good solution. And I say, I'm going to take it to my forum, but I don't think these guys can help me because I've already thought about it. I'm pretty smart, et cetera. I take it to the group and in about 30 minutes, they've solved it. Okay. And this has happened so many times in my life that I'm just stunned. I'm stunned by it. And so what I've come to realize, which a lot of humans don't understand, and this is the YPO experience helped me maximize my relationship with Charlie. What I realized is that in order for me to get the most value from Charlie, I have to put my cards on the table, the good, the bad, the ugly. I've got to put all the cards on the table. And I've got to have him see the whole picture. And that is not easy for the human being to do, for a human being to do. I I remember the first time, I think it was 2012 or 2013, when I was having issues in my relationship. And uh, I had talked to Lilu about it. And and he said, you really should talk to Charlie about about this. Because he he helped me through a few things, but he said, and so uh, I, I met Charlie and I just laid my cards out. And I could not have laid my cards out if I didn't have that very long history with YPO, where I understood that when you lay your cards out, magic happens. And I was laying my cards out in front of God, who's like beyond human, okay? And it took him like five minutes. It, it took him like less than five minutes to like sort through it and said, okay, this is, this is how you're gonna deal with this. And this is, this is, not only did he tell me how to deal with it, he told me what the outcome would be. He said, listen, this is what you're going to do. And this is what the outcome is going to be. And this is where we're going to ride off into the sunset. And it happened exactly the way he said. It's just beautiful. Is that from extraordinary pattern recognition or EQ? Where's that coming from? You know, uh, the the funny thing is, you know, uh, Charlie told me he doesn't read fiction. And I don't think he sees many movies. He, uh, I don't really want to go into this because a lot of this is very personal, but uh, he, he, he gave me uh, the name of a movie, okay? He said, did you see this movie? I said, yeah. He said, go see it again, okay? And I did. And this time I saw it from the context of what he was talking about. So it's like, you know, here's a guy who's bringing up a Hollywood movie uh, to help me with some issue that I'm having. Uh, and I didn't think he would even... Have ever watched a movie like that, for example, right? And uh, so I think I think he's seen so much. You know, he even when he was talking to me about the issues, he brought up his friends who had had similar issues, and he's seen so much. I mean, 
98, you know, I mean, you, you've seen everything under the sun. He's got eight kids. He's got grandkids. He's got daughter-in-laws and son-in-laws and second wife and first wife and all of that. There's a lot of, uh, and friends and business associates and people who have, you know, acted below the belt with them and all of that. They've seen all of that, right? And so, uh, what 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 both of them are able to do, Warren and Charlie have been able to do, they're able to understand humans so well. And and uh, they're like so good at understanding the human dynamic. So uh, I I if I thought Charlie was a great investor, I thought his ability to help me with my personal problems was off the charts. One one thing that strikes me both about Warren and Charlie, that you would have a much keener sense of than I do, is I think they've both improved tremendously as human beings over the years. Like they've worked on themselves. And I I was very struck by that. I've mentioned this before when I went to the Daily Journal meeting and I saw his kindness in, in the way that he treated people around him, in the way that he treated these disciples. And and even I remember as, I, as he was walking out of our interview, and I was, of course, trying to detain him and, and talk longer and ask him more questions. And he said to me in this kind of plaintive way, these people are waiting for me. I can't keep them waiting. And there was a sense of, of courtesy and decency and kindness. And I, I would say actually love for the disciples who'd come to see him that was really surprising to me, given his reputation for toughness. Yeah, I mean, I think I think uh, uh, Charlie, you know, I think I think Lilu wrote an essay about this that they would meet for breakfast, and Lilu would show up ten minutes before for breakfast, and Munger would already be there. Then he started showing up fifteen minutes before, and Munger would already be there. <laughs> and then he started showing up half an hour before, and Charlie was already there. And he's, you know, Lilu was wondering how much before our our stated time. And then finally, Charlie told him, "I come early to read my paper." You don't need to come early. Leave me alone. And then they would both arrive early to do their work, and then they'd meet for breakfast. You know, so I think he, uh, I learned from Charlie that, um, and I actually made a change in the way I operate is to show up early. Show up early everywhere. So if I if I have a coffee with someone at nine nine a.m., I'm going to make sure I'm there at eight forty five. You know, I just and so I think for him, uh, it's very. Uh, very uncourteous to be late, you know? And I think one of his grandkids was telling me that they were all going to take a private jet to Omaha and uh, Munger's, you know, you know, I think the jet was supposed to take over eight o'clock or something. And Munger's planning to get there at like 7.15 or something to the airport. And the grandkids trying to explain to him the jet's going to wait for us. Okay, the jet's not going anywhere. It's not a scheduled flight. But that didn't mean anything to Charlie. He was there before any other family member, you know, and he just sat there and he's just reading. I'll, I'll tell you a story about this, actually, that involves you, which is, as, as I think you know, I, I had this kind of wonderful two-hour Zoom breakfast with Charlie and a few other great investors back in, I think, July 2021. And t- crazily, they, 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 they'd said the homework was to read my book, and they all wanted to discuss the book, which is, this is, uh, you know, I mean, I can't tell you how inadequate I felt as it's like, yeah, I, I'm going to teach Charlie something about how to invest. And it was Lou Simpson and people like that. And, and I knew that Charlie was going to arrive early because I read that introduction that Li Lu had written to. I think the Chinese edition of Poor Charles Almanac, where I think he talked about Charlie always being early. So I signed on five minutes early. And as a result, I'm on this call alone at the start before Lou Simpson, all these other guys, Mark Nelson, get on um, just with Charlie. And so the very first thing I did, actually, is I said to him, you know, Monish and I are friends and, and um, you know, he, he speaks incredibly highly of you, obviously. And, I, you know, I interviewed you for, for my book, if you remember. And, and he said to me, um, he starts waxing lyrical about you. And he said, very specifically, he said, Monish is a very highly ethical person. And he said, he's so mathematical and he's so smart. And he said, he knows he can make more money by being ethical. And he said to me, people like Monish and me, we actually don't deserve nearly as much credit for our morality as we deserve if we were doing it against our own interests. He's like, we're doing, 
we're both actually doing better in business and life because we're ethical. And I, I thought it's a really interesting insight into, into life and business and, and Charlie and you. And I, I wonder if you could talk about that idea of being ethical as a competitive advantage, because I think many of us are taught as we're growing up and starting in the business world or watching Succession or Billions or whatever, we're taught that we need to be hard-edged and self-serving and selfish to succeed. And, and here's this kind of grand old man of business and investing saying, no, you should actually be decent and it's not a zero-sum game. And it, it, it strikes me as a hugely important insight yeah, and actually, you know, so Charlie's absolutely right. Uh, probably a, a huge portion of why I'm so ethical is because of self-interest, enlightened self-interest. Uh, so I think I think what what people uh, don't realize is most things in life function on trust. Uh, they don't function based on contracts. Uh, they function based on trust. And and uh, so if you if you become very trustworthy, it gives you a massive competitive advantage, a huge leg up in life. And the thing is that this trustworthiness doesn't come overnight, but it's it's kind of like on a log scale. So once you, uh, it's like kind of like truthfulness, right? I mean, you you sometimes you tell small lies, but if you eliminate all lies, you know the power versus force we've talked about. What happens is that, you know, those attractor fields come into play and uh, humans, humans feel they can trust you. And once humans feel they can trust you, the whole universe is at your disposal. So we see that in spades in Berkshire Hathaway. You know, Berkshire Hathaway does all kinds of things where they just say something to someone and people will accept that. They don't need to have it in writing or anything like that. It just warns word is enough. And, and so uh, how do you get there? Well, you get there by having a consistent life where you are, have demonstrated repeatedly that you are, uh, you know, playing, playing the game very ethically, uh, playing the long game and looking at things to make sure that your business partners and vendors and whoever you deal with is treated extremely well. You know, uh, Ray Kroc used to say that there were three stools on which McDonald's stands. He says, he says, my franchisees, my vendors, and my employees, right? So the franchisees were all entrepreneurs, right? They, they owned the, and, and he felt he had to make sure that they did really well. The people supplying the French fries and the cups and the plates and all of that at McDonald's, Ray Kroc wanted to make sure they did really well. So he's not trying to squeeze them for the last penny. He wants them to do well, right? Because he says that it's part of my ecosystem. And I have taken those those lessons to heart. So like, you know, if I have a relationship with a printer uh, for my business, uh, I want those relationships to go on for decades. I want the printer to do well. I don't want to be squeezing him every time and get three quotes and take the lowest and all of that. I don't want to do it that way. You know, I want to make sure that it's fair and, and we don't need to go to multiple quotes. We just run our business on trust. And, uh, and so what happens is that when you show trust in, uh, in a company or a human being, they react really positively. So my baseline when I'm dealing with anyone, my baseline is that the other person is a very high quality person or a very high quality company and I can completely trust them. Then I wait to see if they do stuff which violates that trust. If it does violate the trust, we'll move on, you know, we'll do something else. But I think when you upfront demonstrate the trust, a lot of good things happen. So, so I think this, this notion of being ethical uh, running things properly uh, gives you such a tailwind in life that it's, you know, like I think Peter Kaufman says, if crooks knew how much money you could make by not being crooked, they would stop being crooks, you know, <laughs> because basically you make a whole lot more money by being honest. You make a very little bit of money by being crooked. 
you know so it's 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 a complete no brainer to be ethical and honest guy has often said to me that that you have an extraordinary ability to judge people and and whether it's a ceo of a company you're investing in or a friend or a business partner or a prospective investor in your fund or something and i remember you saying to me before that um for example, if you have a lunch with someone and, and, and you don't think they're going to be good for you, you'll just cut them out. You get them out. You get them out of your life because you're taking very much to heart what, what Warren said to you and Guy at your charity lunch where he said, hang out with people who are better than you and you can't help but improve. And I was wondering when you when you're trying to appraise someone's integrity, whether they're a high quality person or someone you actually want to get out of your life, what are you looking for? What are what are, what are some of the tells? Because I feel like I'm not very good at this. I tend to look for the best in people. And so I can be kind of a credulous fool. And I think Guy looks at people and sees their flaws and is much gentler and more tolerant of their flaws. And he'll see, he'll see mutual friends of yours and mine and he'll see appalling ways in which they behave. And he'll say, yeah, they're a flawed individual. And so he's still okay with associating with them. Whereas you're kind of brutal in saying, no, person's out of my life. And so I wonder if you, I'm asking you about 12 different questions there, but if you could talk about A, what you're looking for, the tell of whether someone is not someone, is not a person you want to keep in your life, but B, why you're so extreme in, in sifting those people out. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. So my my dad used to say that to have a great life, one needs one good wife and one good friend. Uh, less is more, right? So, and I find with myself that I don't need a very large network of best friends or close friends. Uh, I I find that if I spend time with myself reading and thinking and doing my thing, I'm very happy. I, I don't need a whole lot. And so when I'm interacting with someone, I, I just want to uh, make it so that those interactions, when I look back at them, that I enjoyed them and those were good and, and whatever. And, and the thing is that, so, you know, the thing is I moved to Austin recently, right? I, I don't know very many people here. What I decided to do is I decided to lower the bar on meeting people. I said, look, uh, I don't know anyone here. When people reach out to me here and there, whatever, I'll, I'll meet them, you know, and I'm going to go through a process to see if I can find, I mean, it's kind of weird that one of my best friends is in Zurich, you know, thousands of miles away, you know, It'd be kind of nice to have a best friend next door, for example, a little bit easier. And uh, so I said, I'm going to meet these people and I'm going to see, you know, like you say, I do my grading after I meet them. And uh, so far, no one has made the grade, you know, so that's okay. They're not bad people, but I just, I, I just asked myself a very simple question. I said, uh, this person I met, do I want to meet them again? You know, do I, do I want to interact with them some more? And what do I want to do here? And the answer just comes back naturally is that, uh, in some cases, it comes back that yes, I definitely want to uh, increase. You know, there's a there's a wonderful guy in Irvine. He and I used to buy, bike every Saturday together. You know, we, and you know, it was really about the coffee. And the whole thing was about the coffee and the baguette. So the bike ride was all an excuse for the one hour coffee baguette in the middle. I think and he was sitting at our table at dinner in Omaha. He was. He was. Yeah. yeah. Lovely guy. Yeah. Yeah. He lovely was. Guy. Yeah. And 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 the thing is. He was so heartbroken when I was leaving Irvine. You know, he, he he tried so hard to convince me not to leave, you know, because we had such a, and I have not found that in Austin. I genuinely loved the Saturday mornings with him. You know, we got physical work done. We had great coffee and everything was great. I have not been able to replicate that yet in, in, in Austin. Uh, and, and I miss that, you know, I mean, I, I, so now our interactions are over Zoom and so on. It's not the same. You know, I, I wish he was uh, in my geography and he wishes I was in his geography. So, uh, so I think that uh, friendships are very important. I, I've seen in, in, with Charlie, I met, I met some of Charlie's very best friends. And many of them have become my friends. 
it's it's very easy to make friends with Charlie's friends because they're really high quality people. I mean, just the, you meet some of these people there. I say, wow, this is all I want to do is be friends with Charlie's friends because he's done all the filtering already. You know, they're so high quality and uh, they're just wonderful people. I mean, I, I've, I'm just uh, so impressed with them. And uh, so uh, I think that it is really easy to tell once you meet someone, whether it's someone you really are excited about meeting again or not. And I think that if my, 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 Situation is very simple. I have uh, 22 years and four weeks left before I leave planet Earth. Okay, so there, there isn't much time left. Uh, and that, that so, gets you to 80, does it? Yeah, 2044, June 11, 2044 is the departure date. You know, so it might be 22 years and three weeks or something. Uh, and uh, so basically, I really don't want to waste time other people's time and my time. Uh, I, I want to have deep relationships where there is a lot of candor uh, and that uh, are people I really enjoy the banter with. I think humor is important. Banter is important. So if we have a connection, the banter is there. Charlie and I, you know, we have such a big age difference. We have so many things that we have banter about. You know, like like I, I talk to him about all kinds of things under the sun, and uh, it's 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 a blast, you know. And so, I'm looking for that, you know. And so, uh, I'm always on the quest for. And I recently, for example, recently, I think I I met uh, a person, uh, a couple of guys actually who are really high quality, and I like interacting. They're not in my geography, but I know that we'll have a great time together. So that's wonderful. One of the things that really struck me in hanging out with you in Omaha, which was just a, a real delight. It was a real pleasure. It was wonderful to be back in, uh, in humanity again after two years of, of isolation in my own head, which is a pretty alien ter- territory. Um, it really struck me that I, th- I thought you had changed in the time since I first saw you in Omaha several years ago. And I remember, I remember several years, I, it must have been about 2015 probably when I first was there with you. And you kind of, I remember you walking out at lunch and there was this kind of, you had this kind of retinue of people who wanted to be seen with you. And there was a kind of swagger and a bombast to you. Um, and you were great fun. I mean, I always loved hanging out with you. You were always funny and charming and, and tremendous company. And this time I saw you and there was a, you still, you probably had much larger retinues of people coming up to you and wanting to take photos. But I would say that it was striking to me that you'd become gentler and softer over the years. And, and there was less of that kind of bombastic exterior. And I, I was wondering if that was something that you'd consciously worked on over the years, becoming a sort of gentler, softer being, or whether it was just me looking for a different part of your personality, or whether it was getting the crap kicked out of you by, by life and by divorce. And, but, but it seems like you've changed quite dramatically over the years. Well, uh, I, don't, I don't think I changed, but I think if you're making that observation, then I'm very happy about that observation. Uh, I, mean, I, I think if, if I move down in that direction, I think that's a great direction for me to move down. So my, my take in Omaha has always been, and I think, I think I thought about it very deliberately this year. I said, look, there's all these people who come to Omaha. They are never going to have any time with Warren or Charlie. Okay, that's just not going to happen because they've already they cut back so many events and all that. So I said that if, if they want to get a picture with me or want to have a conversation with me or something, I just say, just like, like Warren and Charlie do, they just dedicate the weekend to the shareholders. I say, I am here for humanity, okay? So anyone who wants to have anything, pictures, talk, whatever, I am here to serve, right? And I'm here to serve as selflessly as possible. And maybe it was more, and it's possible it's become more reinforced because between 2015 and now, I've had so much interaction with people like Charlie, et cetera, that that type of demeanor and that type of approach has become probably more hard coded. Uh, it's a it's a better way to live, you know. It's a better way to be, uh, you know, low ego and a servant. You know, basically trying to serve the people. So that's what I was trying to do. 
Yeah, it's a it's a profound shift, and it, it was very noticeable to me. I, I, I some someone recently asked me if if I thought you were kind of a little melancholy recently, and and so I was sort of watching watching you in Omaha, and it didn't seem like you were melancholy. It seemed like you were gentler and kinder and sort of softer. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm actually very happy. I mean, <laughs> I've been dealt an amazing uh, amazing hand in life. And uh, I have no complaints about the hand I've been dealt. And uh, I mean, just, you know, to have Warren and Charlie as friends to, uh, you know, I, I randomly picked up a book uh, in 94 when I took a flight from London to Chicago, you know, Peter Lynch's book. That book basically led to a whole set of people coming into my life who are incredible people to have in my life. If I had not read that book, there's no way those people, you and I would not be talking, for example. Okay. And, uh, and so I just look at that random event with that random book that I read and then what that led to. Uh, and I feel very, very blessed and I feel very grateful and, uh, and thankful that uh, this trajectory worked this way. Um, and so, yeah, there's very little I can complain about. In, in life. Um, I think the, the, the divorce actually, you know, most people uh, think of divorce in negative terms. Uh, we, uh, neither of us engaged an attorney. Uh, we split like a nine figure sum between us in 30 minutes. And, uh, and uh, we are still very good friends. I, we have a group chat with the kids and everyone. And uh, both of us are happy, uh, and 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 I'm in a great relationship. So I think that, uh, and Charlie was very helpful to me in making this uh, this transition. And so uh, yeah, so I think I have I have no complaints about that at all. I it think is great. It also struck me that I, I haven't spent a lot of time with Momachi, your, your younger daughter, but I've seen Monsoon a lot over the years, both in Omaha, but also when we traveled in India for several days. And and it also struck me that you you and Harina you'd clearly done something right as parents. And I, I I mentioned to you I think when we were having dinner in Omaha that that Monsoon did something that I thought was really striking, which is where I I went out you know during during the sort of festivities when everyone's kind of crowding into the main hall uh, for the annual meeting. I obviously got panicked because I was like. I, I haven't had four vats of coffee yet this morning. So I went off to get coffee for me and, and Guy. And I came back in and my bag that was on my seat had been moved and I sort of lost my place and everyone's sitting sitting down. And um, and Monsoon, who's what, 20, 20 what now? She's about 26, yeah. 26, looks and sees what's happening. And I'm, of course, a repressed, polite Englishman who's sort of slightly uncomfortable and doesn't know what, what to do. And she... She she basically moves everyone so that there'll be a spot in between Guy and his wife Laurie and next to you, and it was just kind of a remarkable thing. It was like an act of kindness and sensitivity from a young person towards someone who's what I have twenty. I have bad math skills. Uh, 30, 36 years older than her, something like that. Um, and it was just um, twenty six. You're you're a better mathematician than I am. And it was just a um, a a gentle and kind and thoughtful thing. And it made me think that, again, for somebody, for somebody in your position where you're obviously hyper-rational, a very good thinker, but there's also something there where you, you, you did something right as parents. And I, I, I was wondering what, what you figured out as parents that kind of worked because so many of these families are very successful people. Actually, they've kind of wrecked their families. Well, I would I would say that I'm incredibly proud of both my daughters. Uh, they are amazing human beings, and of course, you know, a lot of people would say that about their kids, which is fine. Uh, but I think that they uh, and I, I think Harina and I feel this uh, quite strongly that they are way better than we were at their age. Um, uh, Monsoon is a very high empathy person, uh, so I think what she did for you doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, I think if she feels that somebody is, you know, not in a nirvana state and it's in her orbit, she's going to uh, do a lot. Uh, 
she's kind of like I would think of I think of her many ways like a mother hen. She kind of takes care of the whole kind of ecosystem around her. And uh, many times when I talk to her, she'll get me up to date with extended family and different things going on because she's she knows a lot more and uh, like keeps me updated what what's going on and, and so on. So that's uh, it's uh, yeah. I think she's got a number of great traits. So it's it's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a. But it's I think a, I think uh, in terms you. of, well, you know, uh, when we when we raise kids, uh, we uh, it's just like what happened with me and Charlie. It's not what we say to them; it's what they observe. You know, so the thing is, we think we can tell them this list of things, and you know, as a as a father, that doesn't work. Okay, uh, like you know, whatever you know, the, whatever you're telling them. But I think they they really pay attention it would surprise you how many things and monsoon brings up things with me momachi brings things up with me in their childhood observations they made which i just you know don't even think about and uh, so how we act not just with them but with anyone that they can see and they see everything okay um is really important so i think uh, one of the things that happened with me which was really surprising in my childhood is my father was a very stern kind of disciplinary type guy till i was 15 or 16 after i turned 15 or 16 something happened uh, where he suddenly turned around and started treating us like adults and like for example he he said to me look uh, you know where my wallet is Anytime you need any amount of money, you just go to my wallet and take it. You don't need to tell me how much you took and you do not need to tell me how you spent it. And I have the utmost confidence that you will spend it very well. So, you know, I used to go on dates and different things and I didn't have to go. I never had an allowance, you know, because I had like an infinite allowance, basically, I just go pick money for my dad. And then I'd, you know, go, you know, take a cab in Dubai and meet my girlfriend, whatever else. And it was fun. So what I did with my, with my kids is I went a step further. Okay. Uh, when they turned 14, uh, actually my kids have never had an allowance. So they've always had money and I never put them on that. You have to do this chore to get this money. All that parenting stuff is alien to me. I never did any of that. What I did at 14 is I gave them Amex Platinum cards, okay? And I said, this has no spending limit and you can spend on anything you want and you don't need to tell me or justify to me or anything, okay? And uh, you go with your friends, you do whatever, you got this, okay? You know, all their friends would always complain, oh, I don't have allowance, my allowance is over. They said, and they really couldn't understand this whole concept that why are the parents putting you on this kind of, leash type thing. We have no leash. And I never saw them spend in weird ways. I never saw, I mean, in in the case of my dad, he had no visibility into what I was spending with. In the case of them, I can see the statement, right? I never saw anything on the statement that I ever had to question them about. And then I think at uh, 15 or 16, I explained to them that there wasn't going to be an inheritance, right? And actually, even before that, when they were like 10 or 11 years old, I told them, listen, uh, we are, your mother and I are putting, like the US government allows 15,000 a year tax-free to go to anyone you want. We were putting 30,000 into the account. It used to be 20,000, became 30,000. And uh, we, I said, look, uh, when you turn 18, there will be a large amount of money in this account. It will be more than enough to cover college. So if we are not doing well financially, your college is taken care of. But I told him it's, it's for another purpose. I said, the real reason I'm putting the money in is that I'm hoping we don't touch it for college, that we are able to pay for college. And I want you to choose professions and careers based on what you love to do, not based on what pays the most money or what your friends think is the most you know sexy thing to do or whatever. Pursue things that you are passionate about, whether or not they pay anything. And so what ended up happening is they turned 18. We were doing well. We paid for college. That money never got touched. 
And even now, Harina and I put 30,000 a year into their accounts. They, they have, you know, seven figure numbers in both their accounts. And in both cases, they have taken unusual career paths. And they've taken career paths that are very different from their friends. And I think what happened is that they've never, they got full access to this money at 18. They could have gone and bought Ferraris or drugs or whatever they wanted. None of that happened. At 18, both of them gave me power of attorney to keep managing it. And I kept managing it. They had full access to look at it anytime, write checks against it, do whatever they wanted. That's still the case today. And I, I don't think even $10 got misused uh, in that amount. But what that amount gave them, it gave them freedom. Like my younger daughter, she's doing her PhD in psychology. She told us, I don't want you to pay for it. I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to take care of everything myself. Mm. And she used that pot of money as a backup to, so she went down a path where she knew she could do her thing without, you know, having anything, asking us for anything or anything of that. And, and the older one, Monsoon, she started a fund and the fund will take some time till it scales up, but she's got backup, you know? And, and so I, I was really thrilled. It actually worked out like a fairy tale, you know, like all these, you know, I had a little bit of a seed of an idea for my dad that at 15, you treat them as adults. I said, no, let's move it to 14 or 13. Uh, and let's actually amp it up where we give them, you know, Amexes and all that. And then I also set up this fund for them and all of that. And it's, I mean, we have a beautiful relationship. Uh, I think their careers are unfolding really well. And they talk to me about their friends. The friends are miserable in different jobs they have, and they can't leave those jobs because they are tied into that lifestyle and all this stuff. None of that is an issue for them. When, when you look back and you think about what you learned from getting really serious about David Hawkins and power versus force and this idea of building your life on truthfulness and integrity and the like, do you, do you feel like that kind of set a lot of this stuff, um, set a lot of this stuff up the, 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 both the, the friendship with, um, with Warren and Charlie the kind of partners you've got, the kind of children you've got. Like, was that, because it seems like everything is built on trust and truthfulness and integrity. And in some ways, the, the idea that Hawkins had that these very high uh, levels of, of virtue and consciousness, the idea that this actually kind of radiates out in every level of your life, I think it's kind of been borne out in some ways. Is it a sort of experiment in power versus force, this whole journey of Monish Pabrai? Well, I mean, I, I would say that what might have started as an experiment, uh, I think the experiment has proved itself a long time ago, right? So it, it became very obvious to me. It, it became obvious to me when I was reading the book that that was going to work because he was giving examples of like Jesus and Mahatma Gandhi, et cetera, that it worked for. We are not at that level. Warren Buffett's not at that level, but 40,000 people show up every year. And, and, and I think with Warren and Charlie, what really surprised me, and it, you know, it's really a credit to them that they can see through people. I think they were genuinely able to see through that, uh, or they must have seen through that, you know, I'm a, I'm a good person to hang out with. And uh, Charlie is very, you know, he has the, both of them have very high standards of, of especially the, you know, the people that they spend time with. And uh, so it's, I still have to, I still am in disbelief about it. Because, you know, the, the range of high quality people that de they deal with is really high. I mean, they get the best of the best uh, coming to them from all over the place. And so uh, it's been really good. I think part of it is not just the ethics. I think the ethics is important. It's also uh, extreme candor. So there will be a lot of ethical people, but they may, may be reserved, right? And then I think if you're reserved, you can't build a deep friendship. Uh, you've got to be able to you know, bear your soul. And, uh, and so that, I think that's been part of it where I have found that with a few people, close people around me, I have learned the power of bearing my soul. And I've learned the power of candor. And I find sometimes that when I am very candid with, uh, it happened the other day, 
with a guy I don't know so well, but he's having a lot of struggles with his teenage son. And I, I wasn't sure if what I would say to him would get received properly or not, you know, and I tried it. So I gave him some very direct pointers on what might be a, a good way to, to deal with his, his issues with the son. And he immediately became defensive. And I said, okay, this isn't going to work. You know, this, uh, he's, the receiver is not ready. And the receiver cannot deal with the truth. So I just, I just knew that, uh, I, I, that that person on so many levels was not going to be able to get to where I wanted to get to. It, it was interesting to me because I, I went deep down the David Hawkins rabbit hole and I ended up reading multiple books of his multiple yeah. times. And, and so Power versus Force had a big impact on me. And I think Letting Go is also a very important and very practical and grounded book. But then I got really into the sort of more esoteric stuff like the eye of the eye and things like that. I, I love that stuff because uh, I'm a bit more of a mystic than you are. And I think you, um, you struggled with this stuff that was less logical and rational. And I, yeah. and I was interested in that because I, I, sort of, I sort of feel like you took one idea from Hawkins that was immensely powerful about the importance of truthfulness. And I mean, I think it's a superpower to be truthful and candid, but I, but I think you missed some of the other stuff that was really profound. And I, and I also thought it was really interesting the, I, I'm not saying this in any way as a criticism. I, just, I thought it was interesting. And there also, it always struck me that you took truthfulness as the virtue you wanted to develop. Because when I read Hawkins, one of the things that struck me above all was actually kindness strikes me as one of the most powerful things he talks about. Where there, there's, a, there's something where he, he said, I think the line is simple kindness to oneself and all that lives is the most transformational force of all. And I started to think, well, so, so he's talking about all of these different virtues that if you go big on truthfulness, kindness, compassion, stuff like that, it just changes your life because it changes your consciousness. And so you're going to draw different people into your life. And so for me, truthfulness is really important, although I do still sort of lie and prevaricate and distort stuff and particularly lie to myself. But, um, but, I, but kindness kind of became a very clarifying I'm not saying that I, I'm kind the whole time. If you talk to my wife, you'd get a good sense of how how um, irritating I can be and irksome. But but that to me was almost the most powerful idea from Hawkins was if I just use that as my guiding light of trying to become kinder and not just to other people, but to myself, which was hard, that would change my life. And so I was just curious how you how you thought about the other stuff that you'd learned from Hawkins. Yeah, so, you know, in... Uh... In 1999, I had these two industrial psychologists who basically gave me a bunch of tests, did 360 interviews with all kinds of people around me, and they finally gave me what I think of as my owner's manual. So, so the thing is that uh, I had I had heard about Warren Buffett about five years before that, and I I saw that many of the things that made up Buffett's kind of what I thought were Buffett's temperament and, you know, aptitudes and all of that seemed to fit well for me. Okay. And I was trying to mirror a lot of stuff, right? So they, these two guys said to me that, look, here's, here's the problem. He said that you don't know who you are. Okay. You have no idea. They said, we don't know exactly what went on in your childhood. But what we do know is the outcome of that is that you really don't know who you are. And, he, and, he, and they said that you have a desperate need to know who you are. And so what you're doing is, he says, you are trying on different gloves. And you try on this Buffett glove. And it fits. It looks like it fits really well. And you say, this is it. So then I can just look at Buffett and just clone everything about him. And then that's me. And now I'm, you know, in a nirvana state. And they said, that doesn't work. They said, it's almost for sure that the template that makes up Buffett and the template that makes up Monish are not the same. It may be similar on a number of traits, but it's not the same. So like, for example, what I found in, when I heard about Buffett in 94 is I had been playing bridge 
for six or seven years before I heard about it. I love bridge. Even now I play many hours of bridge every week. And I said, look, there's a similarity with bridge. There's a similarity with analyzing businesses. There's a similarity with investing. I seem to like all of that. Everything seems to fit. And they said, it's not there. And they said, what, what really needs to happen is that you need to understand who you are and to be true to yourself. And part of that owner's manual helped me look inside to see who I was. And I, I, I read that, reread that many times. And what I've realized over the years is that, yes, they were absolutely right. It took me a long time to see this, that Warren Buffett is a very different person than me. There, there may be some areas of similarity, but there are vast areas of differences. And, and those vast areas of differences are not easy for me to bridge. Uh, if I were to try to do that, if, first of all, it, it would be a distortion to try to do that because I wouldn't be true to myself. So it wouldn't even work. And uh, so I think this, this notion you bring up about the kindness and so on is I, even when I read Hawkins, I took the stuff that was easy for me, right? I mean, I'm always, I'm always looking for low-hanging fruit. I'm always looking for the, the shortcuts. And I said, okay, this, you know, being ethical and truthful, I can do this in my sleep. It's easy. The kindness is a much harder thing to, to do. I have learned over the years to become kinder and to be kinder. But I, I think I have a long ways to go. I think I have a lot of wood to chop over there. And so uh, since there's 22 years and three weeks left, Maybe I'll pick up Hawkins again and give that another 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 whirl. I think see if I can should. incorporate. I, I think, I, I, I think some of the stuff in there is really profoundly important. And he, he I, I suspect that Hawkins, if you believe in this stuff, was kind of enlightened, and he's, he's telling you how things work, from the perspective of enlightenment. And what's interesting to me, is when you see. When you see someone on one particular path coming up with the same ideas of people on other paths, um, that has tremendous credibility for me. So when I saw that Hawkins figured out the same things that the Kabbalists figured out and the same things that these Tibetan Buddhists figured out, I, I just look at that and I'm like, ah, okay, that's truth. And there's nothing I've seen in Hawkins yet, even in those really esoteric books that I've thought, no, nah, that's not true. The Kabbalists see it a totally different way. Um, my default has always been every time I've seen, every time I see someone differ from the Kabbalists, my default was always like, no, nah, those guys figured it out. And then, and then you would look deeper and you'd be like, nope, they actually came to exactly the same conclusion. And so I, I think you can go really deep on, on the Hawkins stuff. And I'll be interested to see, to see what you come up with as you, as you get as you look at it with a different vantage point now than you had when you first looked at it. But I, I think what he's basically saying is that the more you kind of elevate your consciousness and sort of purify your consciousness, the more you draw good things into your life and good people into your orbit. But you can take any of these virtues and do it. And so I, I sort of think you went 120% on this one virtue of truthfulness, and I think it's a it's been a really fascinating experiment to see just how powerfully it works. And I see it sometimes when I, I watch you give interviews, and I can see that there's no gap between your thought and what you say because you're not kind of trying to spin and think how to serve yourself. There's so there's a removal of distortion in a way when when you're not trying to protect yourself. So there's some there's something very powerful. I, I, I remember I remember once interviewing someone for the Great Minds Investing book that I wrote, and I, I said to you afterwards, I really didn't like that guy. It was some billionaire that I'd been sort of forced to interview. And um and you said to me, he's misaligned. He's not telling the truth to you or himself. And his career went kind of like pretty ugly afterwards, his career and his life. And and you said, You smell it. You smell that there's something wrong there. That, that resonates to me. I think we somehow sense whether someone has integrity and truthfulness. And, and it's, not, it's not like a, it's not like a, um, a zero, 100, or a yes, or a no. Th you know, it's like there's a, there, there are lots of shades of, of gray here. 
But I think the further you move up that scale, the more the more powerful it is. Well, I think uh, this may be the biggest take home value for me all month or maybe all year for me. Huh. Uh, so I think that I will I will dig deeper. Uh, and I agree with you. I think the the kindness variable um, is very powerful. Well, think of Warren recently. I think it was in March, right? He he wrote you this letter that yeah. um, that you very kindly shared with me at, at that time, where he he said, um, I, "I read from it." He said, "Dear Monish, I remain incredibly impressed by what you have done, are doing, and will do at Dakshana. It's simply terrific. Far more impressive than what business titans, investment gurus, and famous politicians ever accomplish." I'm glad my annual report doesn't get compared to the Dakshana annual report. It's an honor even to be quoted in it with admiration, Warren E. Buffett. And I was thinking about that. Like, why, why, why would a 91-year-old guy with a fortune of over $100 billion bother to write that letter to you? Like, what do you think? It's kindness, right? I, I wonder about the same thing. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I think the thing is that Warren has, you know, Warren been reading the Dakshana Annual Report since the first one came out. He's re- And many times I'd get scribbled notes from him saying, send me 20 copies for my kids and board members or whatever. And sometimes he'd say, you're getting tremendous bang for the buck. Congratulations. Or he'd, he'd write these chicken scratch notes and send back to me probably one out of three reports or something, right? And for, for him to send that letter... Uh, because I know that if I sit down to write a formal letter to someone, there's a process. I have to get Debbie involved and, and all of that and, you know, make sure it's, it's done. And Debbie emailed me saying, Warren wants to send you a letter. What's the correct address we should use, right? And so there's a, there's, it, takes, it takes time to do that. And I think, I think that that letter shows a couple of things. One is uh, that the way Warren and Charlie think about themselves is they genuinely think they are the same as us. You know, even though they've accomplished so much and they've done so much, they really don't have an ego about it. And so they really think it's a human-to-human connection, right? And so Warren, I think Warren sees that there's a guy doing some good work and I can take 10 minutes of my time and I can encourage him and maybe that'll lead to some better work by him in the future. Uh, and also uh, the other thing is that I think for him, the philanthropic side is really important because his whole fortune, everything's going. And I think he genuinely respects because he has the Gates Foundation. He's got the three kids that are getting money from him. And I think he genuinely appreciated the purity of the way Dakshina operates. And I think it's very hard to find that in a nonprofit. I've looked for it because I wanted to just give someone a check. I don't want to create a nonprofit. And so I think he wanted to recognize that this is something uh, someone is doing that is interesting and maybe my letter will encourage him. And I think when he says that I'm glad it you know, doesn't get compared to the Berkshire report, you know, he's being facetious. You know, Berkshire report's the gold standard. I mean, you know, there's nothing you can say about Dakshina report or better than the Berkshire report. That's not the case. And uh, But I think it's his way of uh, it's the same George Soros reflexology idea. He thinks, and uh, and I think it it changes the future of Dakshana in a positive way when a letter like that shows up for me. Because what it does for me, it reinforces the 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 mission. I already ha- am on a mission, and I've got principles I'm following. Once I got the letter, I said there is no way I can even deviate. I got to just go keep banging on this, on this path. And I have to, I have to make sure that I live up to the letter. So, and I think that letter did exactly what he wanted it to do. So, so when you look back now, is, is Dakshana the thing you're proudest of? I mean, you've, you've been extraordinarily successful as an investor, but, but Dakshana, do you sense that that's going to be your real legacy? Well, you know, the way the way I think about it, uh, William, is that, you know, I like to play games. You know, we've talked about that. I'm a game player, right? You know, blackjack and bridge and Dakshana is a game. Everything's a game, right? For Rai Funds is a game and so on. Uh, and I think as a game player, I the other thing I've, uh, which actually resonates with me a, a lot is 
look at the future. Don't look at the past, right? What we talked about with Charlie. So basically my, my goal is to play these games that I love playing. I want to get better at bridge. I want to get better at investing. I want to get better at Dakshana. I want to be get better at being a grandfather at some point and so on. So, so these are games I like to play. And I'm not, I'm not focused on legacy. I've never really thought about legacy. Uh, you know, my, uh, my uh, ex-wife uh, always said that, look, uh, when I die, you know, I want to be cremated. And then you just find the nearest toilet and you flush the, uh, the ashes down the toilet, which, which is a little bit uh, kind of alarming to Hindus. <laughs> Because like in my case, my father and my mother, the ashes were put into the Ganges, which is where the Hindus want to put their ashes and then they, they go in the Ganges. And that's, that's you know, the kosher way of doing it. And I want, I actually was telling my kids that when I die, I want to be reunited with my parents. And so the only thing I ask is put me back in that same river. Uh, so I'm, I, I want to be with my parents again. Right. And so I just said, that's the only thing I ask of you. Right. But my, but my ex-wife has no sentimental <laughs> sentimentality. Like she just said, you know, this is how I want it done. So I, I, I don't think in terms of legacy. Uh, I don't, you know, after we are gone, one theory is we're gone. There's nothing period. End of story. And another theory is that the soul lives on and all kinds of things and whatever. So I am not at all focused on what people think or what people say or whatever, whatever happens after I'm gone. What I want to do in the next 22 years and three weeks is maximize the output from this body and mind. That's all I'm focused on in a way that makes the world better. Monish, I have about six pages more questions and, <laughs> and instead of, um, exhausting you by going to discuss things like um, Turkey and um, China and the like and Tencent and all of these things that, that I still want to discuss. I would, would you come back in a couple of months and we'll do this again and we'll focus on different areas because I, I, I could do a double episode and split it up, but actually I, 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 like, I'm really happy to leave it, leave it here. We've, we've discussed some wonderful stuff and if you'll promise to come back, then I'll, then I'll let you go now. Oh, yeah, that's great. No, uh, William, I enjoy talking to you, but I also think we shouldn't overstay our welcome with others. So less is more. So we should do another. <laughs> we we, we already failed sessions. on that front, Manish. We, we, we should do another session, but we should give people some more time. Yeah. Okay. But we'll. Uh, but definitely, I enjoy okay. I enjoy the sessions with you. Great. It's, it's and, been... uh, and I think this was a wonderful discussion for me. I think I, I got a lot out of it. It's been a great delight for me, and you, you've been, a, you've been a, a great force in my life. You've taught me a lot of stuff over the last few years I, by, through, through cloning and, and, and many other things, and it's been uh, really fun to be on this journey with you, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next how, how many years? 20? 20, 20. 22. And, and on 22 what, years and three weeks. And what's the origin of this number? Why, why, why have you picked this number? So the thing is that most humans, almost all humans, never think about their death. They don't think about when they're going to die and they don't think about kind of, let's say, planning. Okay. So, uh, so that I did an exercise at part of a YPO retreat where they, where they said to us, okay, you're 80 years old and yesterday you died and your best friend is going to deliver a eulogy. Uh, so write your eulogy as if you're your best friend and deliver it in five minutes to the other members. So I was 40 years old when I did the exercise. So I had 40 years to make up because I have to extrapolate how many grandkids I have and what's going on in my life the next 40 years. Then the second part of the exercise after we did all of this, which was, is they said that if something did not make your eulogy in that five minutes, why are you spending time on it? And that was very profound for me. You know, so basically it inverted where you look back and say, what's important? And so that exercise did a couple of things for me. One is the framing. Once you know that you have 
a certain amount of time, then it makes a lot of things clear. Uh, I mean, like, like for example, you know, my, uh, my designer here was telling me that our kitchen should get redone. You know, this home is like 16 years old or something. And if we have to redo the kitchen, we would probably have to move out for six months or something, you know, because all the stuff. And to me, it was really simple. I'm not willing to disrupt six months of my life when there's 22 years left. That ratio makes no sense to me. So I know the kitchen is not going to get redone. Period. End of story. Okay. If by some accident I'm away for six months, which is not planned because of kitchen, maybe we'll think about it. Okay. So it made that decision really easy. If I had not had that kind of framing, I might have said, oh yeah, you know, this would be nice to have, and this would be better and whatever else, but it just made the decision a no brainer. It also made it very clear to me that I won't move again. I said, I'm, I, I have 22 years left. I don't want to spend time moving. It's just a waste of time. And, and so the 22 years makes a lot of things really simple. It also makes it simple when you meet some yo-yo for lunch that you're not going to meet them again because there's only 22 years left. How many yo-yos do you want to tolerate? And I talked to Guy about this. And Guy has an infinite number of tolerance for yo-yos. <laughs> and I'm trying to work on that with him, but I haven't made much progress yet. So I think the framing, the 22 years, makes a lot of decisions easy. It's very interesting. So it's very similar to what Nick Sleep is doing with destination analysis. So Nick said to me recently that he's, in the same way that with, with Nomad, with the hedge fund, he used to think about if I'm sitting on a veranda sharing a glass of chilled white wine with a limited partner from the fund in 10 years' time or 20 years' time, will I know that I've treated this person equitably and decently. And so he's like, how do I get to that desirable destination? What sort of behavior, what sort of input? And he said to me recently, I'm doing the same thing with giving away my money. I'm thinking in 20 years time, will I look back and think I gave that money away well? And he's thinking, what are the inputs to get to that point? And he also said a beautiful thing that you'll approve of, which is he said, um, he said the toughest thing is that I'm doing it based entirely on an inner scorecard. And he said, but the greatest thing is that I'm doing it entirely based on an inner scorecard. I'm not looking to please anyone else. I'm looking to, uh, to, to, to get to this destination in a way that I can look back and be, be like, yeah, I did that well. Yeah, and you know, I think you had, you had asked about the legacy and Dakshana and so on. You know, the thing I feel about Dakshana is that uh, it's, it's actually the outcome of a very strong adherence to a few principles, nothing else. That's it. It's, it's like four principles and being dogged about it. Like, you know, the, the idea came from somebody else. It's not my idea. It's way beyond my pay grade to come up with something like Dakshana. Somebody else had the idea. I just had to clone it, right? And so that's so the core, the core of what Dakshana is is I cannot take credit for it. Somebody else did that. Uh, and the other thing is that these principles that I'm following, these are very basic Buffett principles on giving money away. You know, he's talked about it from time to time. I just absorb them. Right. And, and what I, what I find magical about Dakshana is that we adhere to these principles and magic happened on the other end. It's amazing that the way the magic happened and, and uh, because, because it has such a massive multiplier effect, because we affect, when we affect one life, we affect the life of a whole extended family and we expect, affect the life of a whole extended family forever into the future. So, and we've affected the lives of thousands of families in a very positive way already. And, and I, I hope, I hope in the future, the thousands turn into millions. I don't know how we'll do that, but I hope in some way we make it even stronger, right? So that's why I want to look forward. I don't want to look back. And, and so uh, just that, and all of that is a game, you know, at the core of it, it's a game. I'm a game player. And I just want to play this game the best I can play. And that's the end of it. And I don't really care what other people think or say. The inner scorecard, exactly what Nick Sleep says. I couldn't care less what people say or do about Dakshana. You know, people come up to me and, I mean, people write letters all the time and saying, uh, you know, I like Dakshana, but would you please also do this? Or would you please also do that? Or would you do this? And I, you know, 
my kindness kind of goes out the window at that point. <laughs> and my, my, my response, which is a very unkind response, you might say, is I say that Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see. Be the change. And I, said, I tell them, I leave it to you to do that. All the best. Right? So I say, you know, don't put a gun on my shoulder and fire it. Go fire that gun yourself. So if you feel that Dakshina should do X, Y, Z, you go do X, Y, Z, you know, and take it from there. And uh, I never usually hear back from those people. So who knows what they're thinking? Yeah, you're playing, you're playing the right game for you. And part, part of your superpower of the years, I think, has been your, your refusal to diverge from your game. That, so, for, for example, the, even the fact that one of your principles with Dakshana was we're never going to pay a bribe, whatever. Once, yeah. once you just decide this is, this is the way I'm playing the game, it's kind of like saying I'm just going to tell the truth. It's, it's so clarifying. It removes so much distortion. And, and so I feel, I feel like we, we were talking before about how you were willing to change your mind, but there's also this incredible stubbornness in just yeah. sticking to the right game and the right way to play it for you. Well, some things are not negotiable for Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. They're not negotiable for me. I mean, it's me. And actually, our team at Dakshana, I think half of them would quit when we play the first bribe. Okay, so I think that, I, I mean, self-interest. I would, I would implode the organization if I did that. So basically, another good reason not to pay a bribe is I'm, I'm going to have like a lot of 100 other problems on my hand after that, you know? Yeah. You also got incredibly lucky having the colonel who I... Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, like I said, I think the universe conspires to help you. Yeah. When I mean, you're doing the right thing, the right people show up. Yeah. May, may, th this is what I suspect Hawkins has right, is that when you get your inner life right and you start to behave in a particular way, magical things start to happen. And I have no rational uh, basis for this mystical belief, except that I watch it happen. I see it happen to you. I see it happen to Arnold Vandenberg. I, I see all of the pieces kind of shifting when people change the way they behave and they think. That's correct. Well, William, it was such a pleasure. It's always a joy. Manish, I'm going to enjoy being on this journey with you, I hope, for the next 22 years and possibly even more. Who knows? It's going to be yeah, fun to watch. I, I'm hoping it becomes a little more, but then that's bonus time, which is awesome. <laughs> okay. All right, good. Excellent. Right. Manish, it's been a great pleasure. Take care. All right. All the best. Talk to you later. Bye. Cheers. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.